Thanks for tuning into this presentation. You're about to either watch a video or listen to audio recorded at the Grassroots Radio Conference in 2012 at the Independent Media Center in Urbana-Champaign. Please enjoy. We just got thrown into this uh, fairly recently, and so we haven't planned our uh, mode of attack here quite thoroughly, so you'll have to forgive us if we um, throw uh, questions back and forth to each other partway through. Um, the topic of this workshop is, it's the journalism. We dropped the word stupid because <laughs> that... They asked us to. <laughs> um, but we want to talk about a couple of different things. One is how you do it. And the other is, um, for lack of a better word, why you do it. And so, we'll just talk a little bit about kind of building a news operation. How many people here have stations that are already on the air? How many people have stations that are going on the air soon? And how many people have stations that do local news? And, and of those stations, how many of you have well-defined news departments as opposed to, you know, uh, okay. whenever someone can be there with a microphone to do something? Okay. So there's a lot of different models of how you go about creating a news department. And I think that, um, like, like everything else, it sort of really depends on your local situation. Who do you have available in your, in your pool of resources? I mean, sometimes, um, you know, communities, especially a community that's maybe connected to a university or near a university or something, will have um, a lot more resources than somebody that's uh, out in the middle of you know, rural Colorado or something. But the idea is you want to put together a team of people that will give voice to the local issues of your community to your listening audience. Now, in some cases that's done through paid staff, in other cases it's done through volunteers. Our station has a, uh, a local news program that's staffed entirely by volunteers, but we have a paid news director who coordinates that and all of the other news programming. And so in our model, the news director is sort of the, um, uh, the watchdog, if you will, of the the volunteer programmers, making sure that they adhere to proper journalistic standards, proper technical quality, um, uh, making sure that there's something to fill that space that we call the news program. You know, a lot of times when you're running a volunteer operation, um, people can't show up or don't show up, and you've got to sort of scramble to find an engineer, to find a substitute host, to find reporters. Um, so that's how, that's our particular structure at our station. Um, I know that some other stations have used our local news program as a model to develop their local news program. Um, but really it all depends on the resources that you have in your, in your community. If you've got, um, you know, uh, bunch of um, aspiring journalism students or if you've got people that are really interested in local politics. We find actually that retirees are a great resource because they have time on their hands plus they're mature enough to sort of have the this, this skills and responsibility to know that if they commit to uh, coming in on Wednesday at two o'clock in the afternoon that they'll actually show up and they're not going to get distracted and, and wander off on another project or they're not going to have you know, suddenly have final exams that drag them away. So, so we find that retirees are a great, a great asset. One of the programs we do is a, uh, a labor news program. And for that, we use um, predominantly union members who aren't involved in radio in any, any other way to come in and be the readers. And the, the, the model there is that people hear 
folks like themselves on the radio, you know, somebody that maybe you know you work in the factory with, or somebody that you uh, deliver mail with, and you hear their voice delivering the news, and it makes the listeners feel much more a part of that program and and uh, a part of the station as a whole. Um, in terms of uh, equipment, there's all kinds of stuff out there. Basically, um, news gathering changed dramatically when small portable digital recorders were invented. And of course, first we had the mini disc, and mini disc recorders are still out there, although the, the recording medium is much less available. Um, the things that are probably most popular right now are a product called a Zoom recorder. And that's the Zoom H2, which I still think hands down is the best um, item. The Zoom H4N, this is the older cousin of it, the H4, is great for fixed position recording because it takes XLRs. You can use it in a, you know, in a recording of speech or something like that. But the mics are kind of uh, overly sensitive. <laughs> Uh, to wind noise and things like that, so you got to have a good windscreen. Those are much better, in my opinion. The mics on those are much better. There's four mics on that little one, by the way. There's only two on here. The new Zoom H2N, which somebody had upstairs at the last session, has five mics in it. Um, it's a great, it's a great device. The other one that's come out recently that's pretty, pretty hot is this little Tascam recorder here. The the mics are actually, uh, I think, a little bit better than what the Zoom, the old H4 has. I haven't tried yours yet. And um, these are 99 bucks. Uh, and they have a couple of nice features, like the, uh, the buttons are real easy. It's, it's uh, you know, very easy to record and, and pause and start a new track with these. There's also a larger version of this. This is called the DR5. There's a, there's a bigger version of this, which a lot of folks use, which does take SLRs as well. And that's probably becoming the most popular uh, of the portable recorders that takes the, the XLRs. There's a lot of other stuff out there. Um, basically, digital recording is much nicer than tape, because you're not getting the tape noise. The microphone makes all the difference in the world. So if you're any of these, if you're using it with an external microphone, get a really good quality mic. I kind of like this this guy here. Um, it's a AKG. They use these a lot for instrument mics, but it happens to be also a really good voice mic. It uses a um, nine volt battery, so it's a it's a, a condenser mic. It gets really good quality sound. We've used this. Um, if anybody's seen the film, um, uh, it, God, what's it called? anyway, this has been used in some films, this particular microphone. You it was in Iraq for a while. AKG, what is it? Uh, it's, yes, the AKG one, C1000. I like it. It's also, it's got a nice heft to it. Um, I didn't bring my little extension pole that I made, but I took a, an old um, light kit pole and I added an adapter on it so you can like get in if you're in a crowd or if you're at a press conference or something like that. Anyway, lots of little little things that you can do. May I interject? Please. Um, so one of the most important aspects of, of news gather of electronic news gathering, ENG is the way the TV stations refer to it, is the is your microphone. And just a just a couple of things. Um, this is a, a, a shotgun, it's the Sennheiser K1 module system. So um, they sell you the bottom piece, and then you can buy different heads. This is the shotgun head. Um, this is the most expensive microphone I've ever purchased, $500. I'm not su suggesting you know, that you buy this mic, but um, I'll come back to this mic in a minute, why it's become so critical to me. So with the, with the Zoom, um, 30 years in radio, I never owned a stereo microphone. And I, never, I did voice interviews. I never really needed it. Bought this used last year, first stereo microphone. And actually, the microphone, in, the built-in stereo microphone in this machine is great. What's this, what, what's this, what it's very useful for is if I have this set up at a podium where someone's speaking, 
I'll record in stereo, and if they move back and forth within the stereo field, the way these microphones are oriented, I don't know if you can see sort of a left, right, X, Y pattern, I'm going to get a really, really good recording regardless of whether or not they move in that field. When I get back to the studio, I'm going to turn the stereo recording into mono, pretty much. Um, uh, because for, for news broadcasts, it's generally done in mono. And just one other thing um, I wanted to point out is one way I've been covering um, uh, the Occupy demonstrations in Boston is they, is they, do, they have their, their general assemblies up sort of on a staged, raised area. And what I, what I do is this, because this is a four-channel, actually a four-channel recorder, I plug the shotgun into one of the XLRs, um, and I record the speaker like that, like here, and I point the stereo microphone behind me to record the mic check. You know, so they'll say something, and then everybody repeats, and so when I get back to the studio, I've got this great, you know, three, it's a three channel mix at this point. And you could plug in the other side, you could plug in the soundboard feed and then you'd have... <laughs> yeah, I just don't have enough hands. <laughs> um, but then you mix that down to mono when you get back? I can, yes. Or a, 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 a monaural. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a left plus right uh, mix. But I have the, I have the, it, the, what the beauty of doing it this way is I have the possibility of, of at certain points in the piece, mixing a little bit more of the stereo ambience behind me, or more of the speaker, depending on you know what's been what's being said, and especially with Occupy, with the mic check and back and forth, it's you know. So that's that's what way I've been using. But the H two is a two track recorder. H the H two is a two is a two is actually has a four track capability as well but with the internal mics it doesn't have the option that this one has of using separate inputs but even with the two the two track recorders you can do this and right. you just have one on one channel and one on the other channel what pieces are you in I'm sorry, this the is H4. the h4n okay. this lists for a little under 300 i got it for 225 used but again i'd never owned a stereo microphone before so that's one of the reasons i bought it um, so this is the, the workshop isn't all about equipment, but right, um, right. just a couple of other, so the, uh, the standard microphone that everybody used to use in the old days, the, uh, we used to call it the Buchanan Hammer, uh, the Electro Voice 635, no, 635A is what oh, I was that, thinking yeah, of, yeah, yeah. which um, is very small, very durable, and you can still pick them up for like 75 bucks on eBay, excellent microphone, it's a dynamic mic, you can get it either in, in a cardioid pattern, which is that shape or in omnidirectional, which is that shape. Could you repeat that? Uh, Electro Voice 635A. Um, which was the standard um, news gathering yeah. microphone. The reason it was time. called the Buchanan Hammer, by the way, was not because you could hammer nails with it, which you could, but because <laughs> like Sears, which used to advertise the Craftsman Hammer, if you break it, they'll give you a new one. Electro Voice used to give you a new one if anything went wrong with it. That is no longer true, unfortunately. Um, oh, can I just say one other yes. thing about microphones? Um, in the old days when we were using cassette recorders, a dynamic microphone was quite good. I used the Electro Voice RE50 for 20, almost 20 years. These newer digital recorders need a condenser microphones. Have, they have more push, there's more voltage in those microphones. So I never use my RE50 or the 635As anymore. So, for instance, the shotgun, um, you either use phantom power or a, or a double-A battery. Um, and I've tried using the old dynamic microphones on the digital recorders to not great success. So try to, try to remember uh, uh, that you need a, con a condenser is the type of microphone, di condenser versus dynamic, and uh, cardioid is the, pa is the pattern. The way you'll notice that, like if you're using the H2 with a dynamic mic, is there'll be more noise. There'll be actually uh, like a little hiss in the background that uh, you don't want. You can strip it out at the editing process. Um, in addition to all this stuff, a lot of people now have moved over to using these. And smartphones actually make tremendous recorders. The iPhone is still better than the Android, which is too bad. The Android market has not 
developed a lot of good recording software, although they're moving in that direction. With the iPhone, there's all kinds of, and I don't have one, all kinds of recording and editing applications that you can get. The thing that we did, and I'm happy to share this, although I didn't bring one with, we designed just a little cable that you can plug into your um, jack here and use a regular microphone and a regular pair of headphones with your iPhone or Android device. The one thing to be aware of if you build one of those is that uh, because it's capitalism, Sony and HTC use one pattern for the pin out on the plug and Samsung and some of the other manufacturers use a different pattern for the pin. So if you're going to do it for a news department, you've got to make two cables and have them available and color code them so you know which one is which. Um, just really briefly uh, about Skype. Skype is a tremendously useful tool for recording phone interviews, especially international ones. And I have a whole um, thing which I didn't bring, but I could throw up on the, the list here, which is uh, talking about using Skype for remote broadcasting. And I'll just give you two real quick stories about that. One was a show I did when I was in um, my Lai, Vietnam, for the 40th anniversary of the My Lai Massacre. And I was sitting in a, um, a hostel with my laptop with Skype. And I got, uh, in Hanoi. And I got a Vietnam veteran who lived in rural Wisconsin on the phone. We conferenced that together, conferenced it into the station broadcast that over the air and took live phone calls from listeners all at once. Um, another one we did was uh, covering the presidential elections in El Salvador in March of 2009. I was sitting in an internet cafe in San Salvador with um, this thing, which is like a $29 USB headset from uh, Radio Shack. This one's gotten broken, but it still works. Um, and then I had uh, another guy inside the presidential palace with a cell phone conference the two of us together with some folks in the studio back in Madison who were solidarity activists who had been involved in supporting El Salvador during the uh, Civil War. And then we took calls from listeners. So that's the kind of thing that you can do with, with Skype um, and uh, there's some other competing technologies now for voice over IP, which is using computers for your phone. Uh, Skype is still kind of the one that's best known and most familiar to people. Skype was bought by Microsoft, and Skype is now giving uh, data to uh, Homeland Security. And so they've kind of lost some of their cred. They used to be used by activists all around the globe as a, uh, as a way to communicate without being surveilled, and that's no longer true. But for what we're doing, we're doing it out in the open anyway, because we're broadcasting it. Um, editing software, uh, once you gather all this sound, whatever it is, whether you're recording it from Skype or whether you're recording it in your iPhone or whether you're recording it on one of these recorders, you got to do something with it. Uh, there's several editing programs out there uh, that people are familiar with. I'm not going to advocate one or another. There's one called Audacity, which is free. Uh, it's cross-platform, so you can use it on Linux or Mac or Windows. Uh, there's a new version that's just come out, which I actually haven't tried yet, but it has more bells and whistles than the earlier version. And uh, most people find Audacity to be slightly dissatisfying because it doesn't do everything that some of the more sophisticated, expensive programs do. Uh, the one that we use is called SoundForge. Uh, we use it because it's from Madison. The company started in Madison. We know the people that started it. They gave us the free software. I took it to all the NFCB and GRC conferences in the late 1990s and got everybody addicted to it. Then Sony bought it. So um, there's, uh, there's one that a lot of people like called Adobe Audition. It used to be called Cool Edit. <coughs> Uh, the Cool Edit program that Cool Edit was it called 2000 or something like that was a great program. Adobe Audition I think is a little bit top heavy, a little bit complex for for radio news use. And then you get into even more complex ones like Pro Tools and things like that. Some people use GarageBand, which comes in your Macintosh uh, iLife suite, and so a lot of people use that. 
there's also um, a couple other Mac ones that are out there that um, uh, uh, John Almelo is the tech director for Pacifica, really likes Mac stuff, and he recommends a couple different ones. But anyway, that's editing software. Uh, computer technology, just real quickly, um, almost any computer can do almost anything you want. And so these little small netbooks that you get for, I mean, I I just bought this one. It's in here for a uh, hundred bucks, but you know, a netbook will let you, um, oh, it's not stemming. Um, a netbook will let you edit audio just as well as a, uh, you know, several thousand dollar studio PC. The thing you want is as much RAM as you possibly can and as much hard disk space as you possibly can. A lot of the new laptops especially come with card readers, so you record in your little portable recorder, you pop out the card, you plug it in there, it's all very quick and easy. Um, resources for reporters, there's uh, a bunch of um, really good stuff up on the web. David has provided a tremendous list. The handouts are going around. If you didn't get one, grab one or two. Um, but uh, let, let, me just, let me just mention one more time now that everybody's here. Uh, this is this uh, three-page document of um, web resources and tools and organizations that are very helpful for reporters and journalists is now up, uploaded to archive.org. And just, uh, just do a search for journalists' tools. And I believe this is the only thing that will pop, currently pop up under that name. And um, uh, if there's time, we can, we can mention a few of, few of the more funky ones. But, um, so, but this is it's loaded in as Creative Commons. You can, you can use it and share it. Please do. There's two other resource lists that I prepared several years ago. Um, one is a website called independentreports.net. And there's a page called Useful Links for Reporters. I did it in 2003, so some of those links don't work anymore. I apologize, I didn't update it before this conference. The other one is IndyTech, I-N-D-Y-T-E-C-H dot org. I did that at a grassroots radio conference in um, California in 2004. Uh, we were doing a, a basically tech retreat for community radio journalists and Pacifica folks, and we spent a day, and one of the things we did is we developed this website, IndieTech.org, so there's a bunch of links on there, manuals, things like that. Again, 2004, so I can't vouch for some of the links are broken, I know. Um, but eventually, sometime soon, we'll assemble those lists and David's list, and uh, it's going to be in the appendix of a book that uh, Crystal and Beck here and I are working on. Um, so uh, I'll let you know when that's out. Um, and then the last thing, just really quickly, um, uh, if we're going to talk a little bit about acquiring gear, getting donations, and things like that. Basically, just you know, if people give you stuff, um, it's great. Make sure it works with everything else you have. It's better if everybody in the department is using the same equipment because if you have, you know. 10 different volunteers and 10 different recorders, you're going to be doing a lot more support work than if you have one type of recorder that all 10 volunteers can use. Um, same with computers. If you have you know, Macs and Linux and Windows all in the same shop, it, it gets a little confusing and hard to support. So we tend to recommend trying to standardize on something. It doesn't really matter what, but standardize on something that works in your station and then everybody can learn it and train on it. And I would add to that, it's critical that people on your staff are using the same microphones. Because microphones all sound different, oh, yeah. differently. So unless you want your news reports to sound different, you know, in time, uh, every, try, if you can, to give everybody who's going out in the field uh, the same microphone. Well, and also, if you have like two people in the studio, make sure that they're on the same right. type of mic. Abs we just had that absolutely. happen where, where we had two different people using two different mics, and it sounded like they were in different rooms. Right. Absolutely. Um, there's a bunch of other tricks, by the way, really quickly. Um, if you're doing, um, one great one is if you're doing a phone interview with somebody, and then you get somebody else in the studio, there's going to be a huge difference in the audio quality there. What I actually do is sometimes I 
throw a phone line effect digitally on top of the person that's in the studio to make them both sound the same. Or you can actually have somebody call in even if they're in the same building, just because it really is jarring to the ear of the listener if you have one person on the phone and one person in the studio. So, um, relationship with other departments, uh, just really briefly. It's always great if everyone in the station can play nice. Um, there is oftentimes in community radio stations a conflict between music departments and news departments. It tends to be more than anything else competition over scarce resources, who gets the most time, who gets the best equipment, and everyone always perceives that the grass is greener on the other side. Uh, if you can form relationships where, you know, you have your music DJ come on and do a weekly culture report on your local news show, things like that are really beneficial and um, uh, obviously everybody needs to play nice with the technical staff because they're the ones that make sure that we sound good on the air. I'll toss it to you, David, to talk about journalism and reporting. Sure. Um, just want to add on to what Norm was just saying. Um, you want to cultivate an environment at your station where the music producers want to do interviews, okay? Maybe even music features. But the tendency at most, at a lot of stations, is the music producers don't get trained on how to put together feature reports. So what you're going to do is you're going to create methods for them to, I assume you're going to create this culture of them wanting to do stories and then they're going to have to rely on you to show them how to do that stuff and then you're going to help them um, think th and make them think that you're doing it out of the goodness of your heart but actually when you're, <laughs> actually, when you're looking to fill you know pieces in your news, uh, your news hour you could you know, end your show with a really great music feature. Maybe it's a local band or something that was produced by the music, and it be just becomes symbiotic and synergistic, and it's it's uh, really really helpful. Um, and be persistent. This stuff happens over time. Not everybody comes to a community radio station thinking they're going to be the next Walter Cronkite. You know, obviously. Actually, I, most I know people, I'm dating. Most I know people dating come myself. to a community radio station thinking they're going to be the next Walter Cronkite. Okay, well. <laughs> And then they find <laughs> out. Now they want to be the next John Stewart. Right. Uh, or, or Wolfman Jack, possibly. I don't know. I'm really dating myself. Um, so uh, I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can, because uh, I think we finished at 2.15, and I, we want to have at least 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, in terms of, of, of staffing your news department, what we do at, at my station is Every time someone joins the station, we, we sort of poll them and we ask them, uh, for instance, what current event or issue in your community do you think the station should cover? And we try to keep, we compile a list, and then when we want to go cover that, we go right to them and say, you volunteered. We know you did because you said when, when you first became a member. So, you know, that could generate some, you know, some interest in, 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 in doing some news that way. David, you have the 245. Two forty-five. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I will then slow down. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, when, when you're look when you're looking for you know for, for more people, th keeping the keeping the news department at a level where you can support the shows that you have on the air is is an ongoing chat is an ongoing challenge, um, as we know throughout the radio industry departments have been decimated and, 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 and devastated and I, and, I, and I hold out a lot of hope for community radio to fill niches in, in towns and cities where the commercial stations certainly are given up on this. Um, another place to look for contributors and don't scoff but your local daily or weekly newspaper or t local commercial TV staff a lot of these people have always dreamed of having the autonomy to do what they want to do. If you, we can't pay them, but if you invite them to come to the station to do a story, you know, and, and they have, they, again, I'm going to date myself, they have the Rolodex with all the sources, right? So that's another way. We have, we have people from the public radio station that come over to us and say, you know, I've always Ex wanted exa to. Ex exactly. And, and 
the interesting thing is some in some eras of management, their managers won't let them right. have their voice on air. In other eras, they've been more, more <coughs> forgiving about that. The other thing is, uh, Todd's gone, I guess, but the station in, in um, Western Wisconsin very early on set up a relationship with the daily or weekly local paper in this small town in Wisconsin where the paper itself was kind of dying. You know, it was a small town rural newspaper, but the staff there would come over and do the local news on the community radio station and that kind of reinvigorated the newspaper as well as providing a source of trained people to do community news in that area as that station was starting up. So that's the kind of partnership you could form. Yeah, I mean, I mean, forming those partnerships can be, uh, can be very important. Not to overwhelm the, you know, the volunteer staff at your station. I'm, I'm suggesting these as, as again, as, t as, as, I'll get to you in a moment, as tools to help you when, when in need. Yes? Just uh, at KYRS in Spokane, Washington, um, we have uh, regular uh, interviews that our news volunteers do of the paid journalists at the Daily and Weekly. So they're not even producing a report for us. We're simply just saying, so you have a feature story this week on drones. Let's talk about it. Because that's the least resource intensive um, to simply just ask a journalist to talk about their story you know, vocally instead of talking. You had a feature story on drones in the local paper in Spokane. Oh, yeah. That's great. <laughs> you might want to move there now. <laughs> um, we also, we, it, it, we have two people here who were students and worked on the student newspaper at um, one of the colleges in Madison, and they had a feature on our station where they did a weekly story about something that was also in the paper, and that was another kind of partnership that we were mm -hmm. able to form. Mm -hmm. Ursula, did you get it? What is the, the credit edition? I mean, we, we've had people from the local online newspaper say they want to work with us, but they say they want to credit it to their paper. So when you interview a paper, or you have them on your, what is the etiquette in terms of crediting the news organization? Well, I, well, I think you're asking a, a multi-layered question there. If it's, um, if you're interviewing them for a public affairs show, then uh, they'll, they'll tell you how to, you know, how to attribute them. I mean, you know, this is, this is um, Sally Smith from the Daily Tribune or, or whatever. If they're actually producing a report for the station, I think the standard out cue is the station's, you know, call letters. You know, for WXYZ, I'm Sally Smith. Is, does that answer your question? Well, the way we did it with the Clarion, the student yeah. paper, was we branded it as the Clarion Clips, right? So they came okay. on and they had a little theme so music a, and they had an intro. That's a and, real partnership. Yeah, yeah that's and then they were they were getting the props of being on the radio and we were getting the content in that interactive relationship. So you could theoretically do their report and at the end say, you know, this, this, this report was provided by... Yeah. Well, how did it, what was the wording? There was something at the either the beginning or the end during the music that said this report was done by you know the Clarion newspaper, Madison area technical college students that you know worked with. The the, paper, so. There's no restrictions on this unless it's a call to action. If it's not a call, you write these are all not. Uh, educational non-commercial stations. If it's not a call to action to subscribe to the local Clarion, right. there's no there's no, restri there's no restrictions, and it's up to the individual news news director or news department to figure out exactly what what to do about it. Let's ju just taking off for this sure. for one second off off our agenda, but sure. crediting if you I mean some stations uh, read from the local newspaper on air, and just to be very clear, that's plagiarism. Um, right, and uh, you know people need to be aware of that. That you can't just sit there and, and read the story out of the local paper. We um, we had a, uh, a volunteer one time who thought he was being a big help. He wrote to the all the local newspapers and said, "Please provide us a free subscription because then we'll read from your paper every day." And uh, they wrote back and said, "Why would you you know survive off of our paying our staff and so on?" And, you know so. Attribution now, and and credit is important. Right. And now, now having said that, um, I, I listen to Morning Edition pretty frequently because WBUR is the flagship station of the, of the NPR system, and, and it's in Boston. Um, 
half to three quarters of the stories on the local news that BUR does are generated out of the Boston Globe. They always credit the Boston Globe reported that. Very important. It's very ethical and it's very important. Yes? Yeah, I, I, uh, sometimes I have a full quote from the New York Times, but I attribute it right away. Absolutely. So but how much can you do before, you don't want to read the whole story, but just pull a couple sentences out and attribute it or that's, that's, I mean, that's up to you and how you design your show. I mean, I've heard some shows where they read entire articles. It's not the sort of thing I do. Yeah, okay. But what I'll generally do is attribute at the beginning and at the end of the clip that I read. Okay. What We have a, a third world news program that we do where we use a lot of international press sources. And we tell the people that are writing the stories to try and use at least three different sources and attribute. So if you say, you know, according to a report in the New York Times, General so-and-so said such and such, then you write some of your own stuff and then you say, you know, in the Bangladesh Herald, it was noted that, you know, so that way you're, you're using multiple sources in one story, you're attributing everything that's coming from those stories, especially quotes. Um, and then you're also writing your own stuff, you know, around it to package that for your audience. Yeah, you don't want to say a certain source said and not say to whom, because it, they didn't say it to you. Right? Um, one of the things is uh, the, the firewall between you know business and editorial. Um, the one tricky thing with our relationship with the Alternative News Weekly in town is we there we have trade partnerships with them where we get ads in the paper and they get airtime to underwrite. Um, because of that relationship, it's really important that there's no perception of and no actual um, activity where they're telling me which stories I'm going to run on our news program. So for example, I had a, a writer who I trust there say, I have a great story coming out on Thursday, you want to interview me about it? And I said, well, not until I read the story, mm -hmm. right? So, so it's really important that, that, that somebody at your station, whether you have a news director or a volunteer or whoever, is making that decision for the station and you're not like letting someone else dictate what your content's going to be, even if you have a good relationship, particularly in a situation where there's an underwriter. Right, right. Um, I, I hold it, can you hold your question just for one minute? I just want to quickly get to a couple of more sources for, for people. Um, and I'll take your question and then we'll skip to another section. But um, high school students, high school journalism programs. College students, college journalism programs, they are looking for bylines and they are looking for experience. That's another great place to uh, find people. Access TV staffs, I don't have a lot of experience contacting Access TV, but that, that's, a, that's another place. And I also had on my list community centers um, like, like uh, IMC. So those are some suggestions for finding people. We've yes. done co-productions with Access TV, yeah. by the way, where they right. simulcast our news, so like our election coverage. They'll throw a camera in our studio, we'll stream it to their website, then they'll broadcast it on their cable access, so we do a co-production in that way. I was just going to mention as well that a lot of publications, with a growing number of publications are actually starting to produce audio content of their own. Yes. Um, one of the more interesting examples is The Economist, which is now hiring essentially retired news readers to read the text of their articles. They put that up on SoundCloud now, and that's it. And but it's probably not licensed for broadcast unless you have an right. agreement have to to them. with them. Exactly. Yeah. But what I was mentioning was that what they're doing is they're, they're taking the entire article and reading it. And you know, there's no reason why a local publication couldn't do the same thing as well. I mean, with permission. And you know, when, once you work out the right, uh, the, uh, the right rights uh, for that. One other really interesting trend that I am seeing as well is uh, the the publication Monocle, which actually has its own 24-hour radio station online. And what they're doing is that they actually skip to their own, they interview their own journalists about their stories. So they're, you know, the writers, you know, hey, you just went to this design fair, why don't you tell us about it? And they, they'll fill that out for, you know, a half hour talking about the stories. And it's a great, it's a great source of, you know, meta information about, about the piece. Well, that's a great segue because I was going to jump now to some of the nuts and bolts of journalism, of doing journalism. And my, my first thing that I was going to talk about was, it's called cultivating sources. Um, and I just want to say that in general, uh, uh, news entities allow their reporters who are covering, covering a particular story to talk about it with other journalists. 
Um, and so that's another way of bringing people in, into your station uh, for two ways, you know, for interviews or, or for um, news stories. And I just want to add one quick thing. Um, a lot of, uh, uh, Norm had mentioned uh, uh, engaging public radio news departments to help you. A lot of those public radio reporters, where did they come from? Mm -hmm. Pacifica, community radio, that's where they started. Anyway, cultivating sources. So, you're working on a story and you realize that you need to speak to a, let's just say, a city councilor. The city councilor, um, whether he or she agrees or does not agree to talk with you, always ask, who, to whom else can I speak to about this issue? And I'm not the most organized person in the world, but I'll tell you that you know, having a computer around or a smartphone is, has been helpful. Always list names that people give you. Contact, get, don't forget to get contact information, of course. Um, uh, we, we used to keep, individual reporters used to keep Rolodexes on their desk. Nowadays, you know, you can share on Facebook, well, maybe not on Facebook, but you can share on a Google, in a Google Doc, let's say, lists, and you can arrange them by topic or however way you want to do it, but always ask, to whom else should I, should I, should I speak to? So cultivating sources is very important. Uh, I'm going to go through this, not necessarily in any particular order, and some of this is is uh, is relatable to each other, um, but um, I I one of my bullet bullet points was fairness slash seeking other viewpoints. Um, I believe that the only way to be credible to your to your listeners to your audience is to seek out other viewpoints. Um, yes, a lot of us come from. And the activist community, and we got into ra radio because we were we had a you know a particular mission in mind. And earlier today, uh, uh, Betty Yu said it's a means to an end. Okay, it's important to understand that. But I'm a journalist first. I'm not an activist. Now I've been accused of being an activist journalist and a journalist activist, but I'm a journalist first. Um, and I, when I cover demonstrations, I don't cross over and participate in the demonstration. I invite the activists to talk to me. Um, and in terms of seeking other viewpoints, it's, it's all about doing due diligence and trying to find you know, other sides. Now, I've never believed in there's two sides. I've always believed in there's multiple sides. So if I can, I, I, I seek out as many different view, 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 viewpoints as possible. This is fair. Okay, we used to have something called the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, you know, at my station, we try to tow to the Fairness doc Doctrine, whether it's codified and, you know, or, 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 or not. But we try to seek out um, other viewpoints. You know, in spite of the fact that you're on deadline, that you don't have a lot of resources, it, you know, uh, if you pick up the phone and you try to call and you don't get a response by your deadline, you say in your story, we tried to contact so-and-so, they were unavailable, or they declined to talk to us, but, but it's all about your, your, due, your due diligence. Um, and due diligence is related to, to, to research, so you have to know what all the sides in, this, in a particular story are saying. Um, one way I gather that kind of information is that I never, I, I, I never unsubscribe from listservs. Now I get a ton of listservs. My favorite right now is the Committee to Defeat Barack Obama. Okay, they're awful, but I want to know what they're saying, and they're a potential source. Although I haven't interviewed anybody from there yet. I want to I want to say one yes. other thing while yes. you're while yes. you're looking on there yeah, um, is uh, I mean. To me, this whole myth of objectivity as it's presented in journalism schools, you know, and the notion of both sides of every story. I used to like to say, you know, uh, the New York Times, we cover up both sides of every story. <laughs> um, but most stories have lots more than one side. And 
all of us as journalists come into a situation with a particular set of blinders, a particular set of glasses. I mean, in my case, I like to say it's, you know, uh, uh, white male raised in the late 20th century North American school system, right? That's my, I come into every situation with that. And so what you have to do is you have to acknowledge your bias, you have to acknowledge your blinders, your glasses, and you have to be fair and honest and give voice to the people whom you are interviewing. So, you know, if you go out and you interview somebody, you don't color what they're saying based on what you're seeing. You allow their voice to come out through the piece, and that is what fair journalism is about. It's not this, this uh, mythical J-School notion of, of objectivity. There's a, there's a meme that's been developing over the last couple of years uh, that says transparency is the new objectivity. You know, there's, there, it, there's still debate going on in journalism circles about what exactly the, uh, uh, that means. But it, as Norm points out, it's, it's very important to disclose. Disclosure is very important. Yes? Um, well, I mean, as, if we're speaking as journalists, even at, you know, in the elements of journalism, the book, it says objectivity is not this thing about do we have a bias or not. Objectivity is the objectivity of method. So are we following the standard method of research verification, more research, more verification interviews? I mean, that's what we have to follow. Yes. We all pursue, you know, I mean, we can be activists in the, in the issues we pursue, not, but in the method we pursue, we have to be journalists. Right. So I think maybe that's the objectivity that we have to abide by. You are, you're, you're, you're demonstrating some bias in the stories that you choose. Mm -hmm. And I think community, and, and that's fine. And I think community radio is so important because we're covering stories that are not covered or mm -hmm. not uncovered, whatever, by other media entities. Yeah. The, un, the unrepresented and yeah, exactly. underrepresented, it, it, I think, is the, the sort of the watchword it, of what we're trying to. Exactly, bring but you bring the same journalistic principles to covering those stories. Um, bring your experiences and your biases to the story, but don't flaunt them on air. Okay, that you're gonna you're gonna lose credibility if you if if if, if you do that. Um, so, uh, and I think something that you mentioned reminded me that fact checking is, is, is very important. Fact checking and fact check again. There's a great uh, Robert Heinlein novel where this is one class of people in the society who are professional witnesses. And so you'd say, you know, say oh, is that house white? And they'd say, well, it's white on this side. <laughs> How many of you, when you're researching something, go to Wikipedia first? Be honest, I do. Okay. <laughs> How many of you trust Wikipedia to be completely factual? Okay. You shouldn't trust it to be your end all and be all. In fact, you How many of you scroll down to the bottom of the Wikipedia <laughs> page first? I, mean, I find I find it a great aggregator. Right. Really? Right. Right. But it's the links that you follow that are. Uh, the uh, universities all over the country have outlawed their students from citing Wikipedia in their in their rep, in their reports. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind. But it's a great source to st to start with. Um, and uh, in in terms of in terms of transparency, other issues include you know uh, avoiding conflict of interest. So don't send a reporter who has a more than a 50% stake in a particular company to cover that company. I mean, you know, um, don't send a staffer out to cover something if their wife works for the, I mean, there's a whole, I could go on and on and on, but think about tickets? conflict of interest. <laughs> so why do you get free tickets? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's a problem. That could be a conflict of interest, yes. I'm wondering how that sort of dovetails with the idea that Norm brought up earlier about our labor notes program, where it's actually read by the workers that it's covering. So I, I would say that that is absolutely a conflict of interest that you're talking about. I, but well, I, I although, for instance, yeah, no, it, for instance, in that program, the re we have a woman who works on the show who is a member of WEAC, which is the Wisconsin's the Teachers Union. She won't do teachers' union stories. She'll do stuff about the plumbers or the postal workers. Somebody else will do that. And the people that are reading the stories, the hosts that are reading the stories, they begin the show by saying, I'm a member of local you know, 2448 of the AFT. I'm a member of 
you know, AFSCME Local 60. So they'll start by saying that, so they identify themselves right at the top of the shelf, and then the stuff that they're reading has been written by other reporters. So that's how we justify that. I, I, that's a great question because that dovetails really well with disclosure. You have to say who you're affiliated with. Look, it's an organic process. NPR wouldn't even send uh, people to cover that the big Stephen Colbert rally in DC because they were afraid their reporters would have their own brains and minds and, and they were afraid they would laugh. And somebody from the, uh, what's the conservative paper in Washington? Not the Post. Uh, Washington, yeah. Times. Washington Times would see them laughing at Stephen Colbert. Here, you know, in community radio. I like talking oh, about American Medal of Freedom to a little girl on stage and said, you're braver than NPR. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, so, and, and you know, and it, but it's constantly shifting. Community radio, I think, as, as a mono, you know, if it could be monolithic, like anything else, um, I think has come to the conclusion that this transparency is the new objectivity, and along with disclosure, works for us, works. That it's still credible, and it, and it, um, it avoids some of the some of the problems we talked about. Um, obviously, you know, know the difference between opinion and editorial. Uh, if you're if you're uh, I'm I'm not exactly sure what the rules are in regards to whether non-commercial stations can edit you know editorialize. I don't think we really can. But public affairs shows, uh, talking heads kind of things, they push the envelope in terms of opinion versus you know ed editorial that's something that every station kind of has to get get a feel for again the rules about disclosure come come into that uh, it also as depends well. on your on your nonprofit status and sure you, sure you, editorializing as a 501c3 is a little bit different than editorial right, right. When you're not. so a, a, a couple I have a couple telling quotes. And I don't know who said this first, but I heard Governor Deval Pat Patrick of Massachusetts say this in the context of talking about the health care reform bill. He was, very, he, he's, he was very upset about how people across the country were you know, referring to death uh, panels and Obama's murdering children in their beds because of health care reform. And Governor Patrick said, um, everyone is entitled to their own opinion no one is entitled to their own facts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Daniel Moynihan yeah. said it first. Did Daniel Moynihan say that? Okay, MVP. great, great. So it's not surprising that Patrick, a Democrat, got it from, from, uh, from Moynihan. So that's something to think about. Um, back in the late 80s, I was covering, uh, I was covering, actually it was a journalism conference at, at, at the Harvard Kennedy School, circa 1988. And Carl Bernstein was there. You all know Woodward and Bernstein. And Carl Bernstein said something that has stuck with me forever and ever, which is it's the role of the reporter or the investigative reporter to find the best available version of the truth. Mm -hmm. The best available version of the truth. Okay, so that it's, it's multi-layered in there. You're gonna do your best, you're gonna do your due diligence, and you're gonna, and, and, be aware that stories evolve over time. So if you don't get it completely the first time, hopefully you have the facility and the capacity to cover things over time. And I also want to say that it's important to admit when you got something wrong. Um, I, we don't have one at, at my community radio station, but some places have an, an ombudsman. So that the listener, if the listener wants to comment on a story and say, I don't think you got that right, you know, most newspapers, NPR has a, has a very important ombudsman, um, can weigh in because they, they're kind of the most objective person in, in, that, in that institution and they're not afraid to criticize the news department if, if, if they get it wrong. Um, just a, I want to just get through a couple of quick things and we want to... Um, uh, open it up for Q&A. Very important to build an archive of all the stories you've done. You know, so some of you folks are going to be part of new radio stations. I imagine some of you will be part of some of these new LPFMs. Archive everything. It used to be you had a you had a you had a closet with uh, with spider webs and you had the 12-inch reel-to-reel tapes. 
Um, actually, some of those may last longer than some of these computer files, which the Library of Congress decided after doing a 10-year report that, anyway, that's a problem. But there's no reason you shouldn't be archiving everything. Um, uh, yes, go ahead quickly. To add to that, yes. metadata, metadata, metadata. Yes. Uh, it sounds really geeky, but if you're searching for stuff uh, six months in the future, 12 months in the future, if you don't describe it in ways that you can retrieve it later, you're going to have a really hard time with interview one dot WAV. Yeah. Oh, what was that you know, on that date? What, I, I'm going back now, and I'm digitizing old reel-to-reels. One of my biggest challenges is that the tape, not the tape tape, the, the adhesive tape, the scotch tape that I used to put the label, it's all falling apart after 25 years. And so I have to listen to the whole <laughs> reel and just figure out, figure out what's on there. What I usually use for digital file names is the name of the person you interviewed, the date Dates of the interview, yeah. right in the file name, and then maybe the topic, you know, um, uh, you know Robert Smith on healthcare 727.12. If you have to abbreviate because you're, you know, whatever, your, your word processor doesn't allow, your operating system doesn't allow long strings, just maybe keep, keep a list of all the abbreviations. Yeah. But also, um, <laughs> one quick trick, if you're switching between platforms like Windows, Mac, uh, Linux, don't use spaces in file names. This is a big pet peeve of mine. You can use capital letters, so, you know, capital J-O-H-N, capital S-M-I-T-H, but no space between the John and the Smith. It's just, uh, it's, it's safer when you're popping back and forth between different operating systems. One reassuring thing is the new version of Word is not going to be compatible with any of the bad versions. Well, that's... Uh, I hate Microsoft. That's capitalism. <laughs> anyway, um, just a couple of other quick things. Uh, be as local as you can. I personally think local community radio is going to save it's, it's going to save the industry um, as everything falls apart around us in, in, in commercial radio. And, um, and, and I also, um, in, terms of, in terms of having hope and change, I mean hope, um, think about all the, all the weather that we've had in the United States. I mean, in Massachusetts alone, in the last uh, 12 to 18 months, we had an earthquake. We had a tornado that almost destroyed Springfield, Massachusetts, um, you know, and the usual blizzard and a, and, and a hurricane. And people go to their terrestrial radio first, studies have shown. Um, well, and in fact, with that big power outage that you guys had on the East Coast where the internet was down right, in right. a lot of sectors, um, before you get too far away from yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm about done. Okay. Well, I, I want, no, I want you to talk about the covering versus participating. And then I want to talk about the NPR versus okay, radio. Okay, sure. Okay. Well, I think I, I, I talked a little bit about covering versus participating. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't, I haven't, and it, this goes back to, the, to this Colbert-Stewart events that NPR wouldn't let their reporters go to. Um, but I have no problem if, if the people around me are participating in something, but they're not going to cover that as, as, as a story. Now, you know, in journalism circles, in traditional journalism circles, they'll say, well, that, that reduces the credibility of that, that particular reporter. Um, but it's all, about, it's all about building trust with your, with your listeners. And if your reporters are, are covering stories, researching the story, looking for different viewpoints, doing their due diligence, um, and, and, you know, and writing um, compelling stories, you will, you will, and getting out into the community, we didn't really talk about that, there should be opportunities at your stations for the news staff to get out and interact with your listeners and the greater community. Music staffs do this all the time, at concerts and all sorts of things. Uh, but your news staff should do that a little bit too. Uh, that, will, that will build trust. Um, when I'm covering, a, when, when you're covering a story, um, uh, you know, and, and you know, the Occupy Wall Street stuff is a good example. You can't, you can't jump over and start holding a sign and, 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 doing, that, and doing that sort of thing. Um, the, the, the closest, you know, I get is if the police are forcibly arresting someone and hurting someone, I'll get in there with my microphone, I'll try to interview the officer and at why are you doing this? Um, uh, and in many, many cases, and, and about 45 reporters were arrested around the country as a result of covering Occupy, 
um, you may risk arrest. But I never step over that that line between covering and, and participating. Yes? I had a, a mentor uh, many years ago who really drummed it into our heads a very simple statement. When you become part of the news, you're no longer a reporter. And when you, when you, when you start acting out, you're supposed to be an observer and report. That's what you're supposed to well, sometimes you become part of the story uh, as a result of If you're arrested, if you're arrested, yeah, exactly. Right, right. Or getting right. arrested. Right. But it is, it is as a, a journalist, you are supposed to observe and report. And the minute you step up over that line and you become part of that story is when your credibility goes out the window. Yes? Part of the appeal of why I got into community radio and just community media in general was because I felt like it was more I could be, I mean, obviously the news first person in the story, but I, I mean, I just increased that it was that statement because that's why I never wanted to go to conventional media. I couldn't see myself just being this, like, just this fly on the wall, this objective, like, you know, the hypothetical objective reporter. Um, I felt like I could still be passionate about the issues. Absolutely. Now, at the same time, like, I don't, like, I see that there's a very, very line of, like, yes, crossing over and actually participating in, um, in the movement. Well, this, this is where I wanted to go in talking about sort of the difference between, between commercial news and NPR news and community radio news, because I think it's an important distinction. Commercial radio puts news on the air for one simple purpose. They want to get more listeners so they can charge more to their advertisers. So news is used as infotainment. And that's why you have, you know, the news usually includes, you know, traffic on the 8s and weather on the 11s and whatever, because they think that'll draw listeners to their station and then they turn around to their advertisers and they up the price. NPR has a very different news philosophy. And the NPR news philosophy is basically the more you know about stuff, the better of a person you will be. And this is, I mean, it's a good liberal news philosophy, but it basically, it has the same failing as the game Trivial Pursuits. Everything has the same value. So Susan Stamberg's cranberry sauce recipe gets as much airtime as how many people were killed in Iraq. In community radio, I argue that we have a different philosophy, and that philosophy is giving people information about issues that affect their lives and tools to become active around those issues. And so the way that plays out in real life, I always like to use the example of this uh, cheese warehouse fire in Madison in 1994. So there's this cheese warehouse. So how does the commercial radio, you know, oh, big flames, big fire. Right. NPR says, well, you know, we're a statewide network and we don't really think that our listeners in Poinette or Rhinelander will care about that thing in Madison. Community radio is, well, what about the people that worked in the factory? Were they evacuated? Were there toxic fumes? Is there a neighborhood evacuation? Where do people go to get resources? Is the Red Cross doing something about this? Does the city council have something? You know, so those are the, those are the ways that we cover a story as community radio journalists. It's about, it's about information about issues that affect people's lives and tools to become active around those issues. And, and I mean, I would, I'm a, huge act, advocate of bringing your passion uh, to the story. Uh, this is an issue that uh, there's tension over it at stations and there's an ongoing tug of war. I think every individual, every department and every station kind of has to find the right place for them. I have concluded that, that, that I have to protect my credibility and the trust that I've earned from listeners. So I do certain things but I I don't do sir. Great things. story about that. In yeah. Wisconsin, we just had a recall election. And in order to stimulate the recall election, there was a recall petition. And people signed the recall petition. And they put the recall petitions up on the web. And then all the right-wing groups went and they looked and they saw, well, which reporters signed the recall petition. And then they attacked those mostly newspapers. And they said, you know, your reporters are, you know, advocates here. Now. I personally did sign the recall petition, and the way I justify the difference, because I, I won't sign a candidate's nomination papers and I won't give money to a particular candidate, mm -hmm. but I saw, in my own mind, signing the recall petition was simply signing a document that said, 
there should be an election. It wasn't advocating a result in that election. Now, you know, other people may take other points of view, and certainly the right that attacked these newspapers took a different point of view. But I think that you need to, as you need to make those distinctions very clear in your mind and adhere to whatever system you develop, and then you can defend your your position if challenged. An another quick example is when people approach me and say, "We just we're just trying to get candidate X on the ballot." I'll sign that. It's just ballot access. But I avoid signing issue-oriented petitions because I'm a little afraid of, of this situation. Now, I have very clear political viewpoints, and I, I, that comes through in part based on the stories that I cover. Now, I won't even sign to get candidate X on the ballot because then that, the way it works is, at least in Wisconsin, you can't sign anybody else's petition, so it does become an ad. But that's just me. <laughs> it's, a it's a line you have, yeah. to, you have to straddle. for an online news publication called Open Media Boston. And when people uh, post, they have to choose one of four categories. Okay, so my category is staff. Uh, we have a participant category, and it's clearly in the byline. I don't consider that journalism. So I'm, gonna ha I'm, I'm not gonna stop you from doing what you do, but I'm, I'm gonna disagree on what we call, on, on what we call it. Well, but it's, but it's I, would, I would argue there's a difference between between writing a story for a magazine about your experience mm -hmm. and doing sure. a news report yeah, sure. about sure. an event. Sure. Right. Yeah. Sure. Like, I just, I, it would be a different thing to me, but I don't see an ethical uh, Are you ready to we, yeah, open we, it up? Yeah, Let's open it up to Q and A yeah. and have a discussion. Uh, I saw your hand first. Uh, yeah, I, I do want uh, maybe you to spend a, a couple minutes on what we should be. Were concerned about, you know, uh, warned about with the upcoming elections in terms of covered what's what's kosher, what's not. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to get back on the, the thing about editorializing. How we handle this is kind of a semantic thing that we, uh, I guess, we define editorializing as the station itself taking a position. And so, as long as an individual programmer disclaims that this is not the, uh, the opinion of the station and staff, the board, or, and all that, then, then we allow that. Is that, are we? That, I mean, that, the way that we do it at our station is similarly, we don't muzzle our programmers, but we ask them to state that they're, it's their personal opinion, not the opinion of the whatever. It's not a good idea for your programmers, even if they state that, to endorse a candidate oh, yeah, yeah. on your we airwaves, because that. that's yeah. a whole separate animal, right? Yeah. Endorsing of candidates. The other thing is we allow programs to editorialize, like the Third World View program might do an editorial about a topic, not a partisan electoral issue, but a topic, you know, uh, the flood in, uh, you know, uh, Thailand or whatever. Um, and certainly, you know, when you have guests on the air and they speak their opinion or their advocacy for issues or whatever, you want to say, you know, that's your opinion, that's the guest's opinion. Um, not the opinion of the station. As a station, we don't editorialize as the station, and we have a statement we say, uh, you know, WRT doesn't have opinions, our listeners do. And that's the way that we handle that terrain. Okay. And then as far as election stuff? Well, could you be a little more specific? Well, I mean, if you have a candidate on the air, what's the equal access and, and that kind of thing? And the way the FCC rules work on this, and it's changed in yeah. recent years, 
The actual thing called the equal access provision was struck down because there were only two candidates who ever used it, to my knowledge, in the history of community radio against community radio stations. One was Lyndon LaRouche, the other was Ralph Nader. When Ralph Nader used it, all of a sudden they, they vacated the rule. Um, the equal access provision used to say that a candidate for federal office could get on the air at the least cost rate, which is in community radio free. Um, there is still the provision that says if you have a candidate's voice on the air, and it doesn't matter if they're talking about peanut butter or if they're talking about the election, if you have a candidate's voice on the air, then you have to put something in your public file which says we had this candidate on the air this amount of time, this program, blah, blah, blah. And then the other candidates are able to come to the station, look in your public file. If they see that candidate was on, then they can request time. But you don't have to call them up and say, hey, we had your opponent on. Do you want to come on? And you know, there's no provision there. So the form is very important. And I'm happy to share a copy of it with anybody that wants. But it's very important to file that. And we do it for any candidate that's on the air, even if they're on a program that's what they call exempt, like if it's what they call a bona fide news program, if you you know if it's a if it's your local evening news and you're out at a rally and the candidate is speaking and you get their their voice on there, that's actually exempt from this public file requirement. But because it's such a shifty territory to figure out which is which, it's much easier to say any time a candidate's voice is on the air. File one of these forms in your public file. It only has to stay in there for two weeks, um, and they or they have two weeks to come and see it and ask for equal time. But anyway, so that's that's the way that works. And anytime you have a candidate's voice on the air, put it in your public file. It's a good practice to always try and invite all of the candidates on an issue. So you know, city council race, school board, those are pretty e easy. If it's somebody running for senator or governor, you know, it's going to be a little bit trickier to get everybody to come into your station and be on the noontime call-in show. Um, but it can be done sometimes. Um, if you're um, if you're covering, you know, one particular race, try and give. Like, so one way that we do it is if we don't get them all in the station at the same time, we have like, you know, this week we profile this candidate, this week we profile that candidate, and so on up to election time. So that's, that's some ways of doing it. Uh, uh, city council elections in Boston are, are, can be free-for-alls, so there's, there's some citywide seats, and often 10 or more people will run. So what we've done is we've invited all of them, and what we've done is we've turned it into a public forum, and generally not live, but we've generally recorded it for later broadcast. You know, some of them come, some of them don't. But as Norm pointed out, we, we put that information in the public file and we have space for them, to, for the others to come later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, and a method for that we've used in, in New Mexico for that was to actually publish the notice of the, of the public forum. And you put that in your public file as well. And with the moderator, everybody has three and a half minutes and there's your balance of time. And I, I, I still fall back on the equal time thing, and I encourage it because it is it brings great radio. And and so while that may not be the full requirement now, it makes great radio. And and so I still we've also partnered with other groups right. to broadcast their debates. So like League of Women Voters did a debate, right. and we took. Right. a bunch of equipment over there and set up and right. Mike did right. ourselves and broadcast the debate live right. at the same time as it was happening in the public library and you know we went to the mayor's candidates debate that was in some theater and we did the same thing right. you know we got a feed off the board and we broadcast it live so that's another way of partnering with other groups that are already doing debates plus it increases the profile of your station absolutely absolutely um, kind of back to this issue of, of standards for journalism and I, I, I don't know where I fall in, in every sense but and, and I don't want to bring up an example of corporate and uh, NPR doing something so it's okay if we do something the other way but on the other hand it seems that they, they have this kind of false uh, pretense of a, of a standard and but liberals get uh, hyper picked apart. One, one thing that, that, that really struck me is every time there's a threat to uh, CPB funding and, and so forth, 
all the NPR and PBS, they get all defensive and they say we're not liberal and they do the programming that kind of proves it. And in Kansas City, we have one of the six CPB board members, outgoing manager of the KC, or the NPR affiliate, come on the air on one of these most recent times and said, you know, and then the host asked, is NPR liberal? And she says, uh, well, you know, I remember when NPR first started, one of the first things all things considered did was cover a Vietnam War protest. And when I listen to that now, it sounds, sounds kind of liberal, but just as, as I'm not 20 something anymore, the station is now 40 something, so we're so, and, and that's pretty close to quote, but paraphrasing now, it's like, uh, we're so mature now, we, we don't cover war protests. And, you know, I don't know that I want NPR to be liberal. I don't, I want them to give them important information and have that be the mission, not, oh my God, we have to be uh, non-liberal or we'll lose our funding. We'll probably lose their funding anyway if that's, if that's all the value. I, I, I heard a very interesting interview with, of all people, Susan Stamberg. And Susan Stamberg told the interview, of course we're liberal! Conservatives exist to conserve and preserve the status quo. Liberals exist to challenge the status quo. We're journalists, we challenged. Su Susan Stamberg. Now, she's probably on the outs at NPR. She's probably not <laughs> the, you know, part of the decision making, but that, that, that really stuck with me. Yeah. Well, I want to say something about the attacks on CPB funding, because I think this is actually, th these are actually very serious. Um, and, uh, and need to be responded to. In 1995, when Newt Gingrich went after funding for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, um, we actually, we wrote a letter at the time that said something to the effect of, uh, you know, not only should they not cut funding, but they should increase funding because community radio is an essential component of a free and democratic society because we're the ones that provide for an educated, listening audience who in a democratic system are supposed to make informed choices and convey their you know sentiments to their elected officials blah 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 at that time big bird and reading rainbow saved funding for cpb yeah that's true that is no longer the case they no longer have the kind of of cachet that they had in 1995 and between the push from the right to say, oh, you should, you know, uh, Sesame Street should be like Barney. You know, you should have your, your spin-off of, of products that will support your programming. And the fact that most people in Congress confuse CPB and NPR. Most people in Congress think that we have to cut funding for NPR because they're too liberal, so they cut CPB. Well, that affects all the rest of us that are doing so many different things in our local communities that aren't NPR. And finally, I can't not complain about the fact that um, President Obama and both sides of Congress were tremendously deceived and ill-informed about the PTFP. Right. Public Telecommunications Facilities Program, which nobody, and I talked to a couple of different senators about this, nobody could get through their minds the fact that PTFP and CPB were not duplicate services, that PTFP provided small stations like ours, we, we low power city, yeah, for that, right. PTFP provided to stations that were not eligible for CPB funding. They still got equipment through PTFP. And so that was a tremendous loss. We will not see that come back again. And um, it was a failure on our part to not be able to convey that properly to our elected officials. Yeah, and, and I absolutely agree we should have more CPB funding. And I can understand the fear of losing the funding. And we did lose the PTFP. But I don't think the answer is being so defensive. Circle the wagons, the right, right, right. CPB, by the way, for those of you that aren't CPB stations. In addition to the direct funding, you get all kinds of other support, like they pay your broadcast licensing fees for music, they pay your internet streaming fees. They, so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big hit for those of us that are CPB recipients if that program disappeared. It's, it's more than just the money. Well, thank you. Looks like we're out of time. Thank you so much.
just quickly a reminder, um, archive.org, and then search for journalists, tools, and you'll find the three pages of interesting websites and tools for journalists. A couple of us have put it up on the Twitter as well. Yeah. Great, excellent, excellent. Yeah, anything that's left we'll put upstairs on the lit table for anybody that else that wants it to. So. We did in a short amount of time. I have just one sort of friendly amendment to, to this uh, idea about NPR giving um, stories equal value. Based on their clock, they will always do the most important international story first. You've been watching or listening to a presentation recorded at the Grassroots Radio Conference 2012 at the Indie Media Center in Urbana, Champaign. Thanks.